everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you've never seen my face before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will let you know whenever i post a new video i hope everything looks okay right now i recently got a new camera and a new lens and this is the first time that I'm using it. I thought I would upgrade my filming equipment a little bit because my previous camera I've had literally since I did a level photography at sixth form which was a good few years ago now so i thought it was about time that i purchased a new camera i'm hoping this one will improve my video quality so let me know what you think in the comments. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the case of David Twig. He was a 46 year old man who was murdered in 2011. For just under three months, the detectives involved with David's case really struggled to determine who was responsible for this horrific crime and what their motive was. But then the investigation took a dark turn when evidence suggested that the killer was closer to her than they first thought. But before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to one of my favourites, Function of Beauty, for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. I've been using Function of Beauty's hair care for well over a year now because I just love how they allow you to customise your products so that they best suit your hair. All you have to do is head to their website and complete their super quick two minute quiz in which you outline your hair type and what goals you have for your hair. So for example, I usually pick things like deep condition, hydrate, volumize, strengthen, oil control and they will create you a shampoo and a conditioner specifically for your hair based on the answers that you gave. Additionally you can pick the scent of your products and they have such a wide range of scents to choose from. I try to switch it up every time. So for these ones I picked the scent mango, grapefruit and mandarin which oh my god, just smells incredible. I think this is definitely one of my favourite scents yet. As well as the scent, you can also choose the colour of your bottles. So I picked black for my shampoo and pink for my conditioner. And you can choose the name that is printed on your bottles. But they don't just do shampoo and conditioner, they also offer other hair care products that are fully customisable. They have leave-in treatments, they have hair serums, and my personal favourite, hair mask. I love using their hair mask so much when I'm having a little pamper evening because they just make your hair feel so smooth and soft. Function of Beauty are 100% vegan and cruelty free. There are no parabens, sulfates, GMOs, toxins in their products. I really cannot recommend them enough. And they are currently offering you guys the incredible discount of 20% off your first order with them when you click the link in my description box. Once again, thank you so much to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel and now let's just get into the case. So for today's case we are going back to the year 2011 in a little village called Burr -le Marsh which is located on the outskirts of Skegness in the county of Lincolnshire in England. Burr -le Marsh was described as being just a nice quiet place to live. It's one of those places that we talk about a lot in these videos where everyone that lives there knows each other well, everyone is very friendly, everyone gets along really well. It's a happy little Little village with a good community and low crime rates. And one of its residents was David Twig. He was 46 years old and he had lived in Lincolnshire all his life. Now I couldn't find too much information online about David's background and his upbringing. I know that he was an only child and that his parents were called Roy and Janice Twig. And from what I can gather he was incredibly close to his parents and Roy and Janice were always very good parents to David. David was described by those that knew him as being just a really nice person. He was always there for other people, always happy to help others. He was kind, he was hardworking. He was just a good person. No one ever had a bad word to say about David Twig. He was a very well-respected member of the local community. And David was married. His wife was a woman named Julie Dixon. She was 43 years old and the two of them had been together for about 50 
15 years since 1996. Julie had been married once before David but obviously she got a divorce and I don't believe the two of them had any children. Julie was described as being quite a loud and outgoing kind of person whereas David was a little bit more quiet and reserved but I think they balanced each other out quite well. I couldn't find much information about Julie's family but David's family so his parents really adored his wife. They loved Julie so much so that they just saw her and treated her as if she was their own daughter. David and Julie lived together in a bungalow in a pretty remote area of Berlin Marsh. It wasn't too close to a main road or anything, it was pretty out of the way and this bungalow was actually also both their places of work. You see David and Julie actually ran a business together. David worked as a joiner so he would build and make a lot of things. He specialised in bathrooms and kitchens but he also made wooden doors and he made windows and worktops. He was very good at his job and his wife Julie worked alongside him but she worked on the more business side of the business so like she dealt with the finances and the accounts and she would take the bookings and make phone calls that was all her. David was the labourer he dealt with the practical side of things and Julie was the administrator and I believe they worked in a building on the side of their bungalow so I think their bungalow was either converted or they'd had an extension at some point so that they could have a business side of their property so there was a little office where Julie worked where she managed everything and then close to the office was David's workshop which was actually pretty big he had a lot of machinery in there everything he would need as a joiner and then at the back of the business side of the property was a hallway area and in this area was David's storeroom or store cupboard where he kept his tools and a couple of other extra things that he didn't keep in his actual workshop and by all accounts Julie and David worked really well together both in the business as business partners I guess and also just as husband and wife. Those that knew Julie and David just said that they were a really good happy couple. In fact people described the two of them as being almost inseparable. I feel like for a lot of couples both living together and working together and working in the place that you live together would be quite difficult because you're with each other 24-7 but it seemed to really work for David and Julie. They enjoyed spending every single day with each other. Everything seemed to be going really well for the two of them. They seemed very happy both in their marriage and in their work but then suddenly on the evening of Sunday the 13th of March 2000 and 11 a 999 operator received a phone call and on the other end of the line was Julie Dixon. Julie was very very panicked on this phone call and she frantically told the operator that she and her husband were just in their workshop when all of a sudden they were attacked by two people who then set their building on fire. Julie herself had managed to escape the two attackers and escape the flames but her husband David was still inside the home and he couldn't get out he was trapped inside the part of the property that was on fire so fire crews were immediately dispatched from Skegness and they went straight to the home of Julie and David and when they got there they spotted Julie in the yard and she rushed them to the part of the building where David was trapped now by the time the firefighters arrived at the scene it did take them around five to ten minutes to get there but by the time they arrived most of the fire had actually died out because it wasn't a huge fire it wasn't like the entire building was on fire it seemed as though it had been set and it remained towards the back of the building in and around the storeroom which if you remember was where David kept his tools and by this point when fire services arrived at the scene there weren't really any more flames the fire had gone out but the area was still consumed with hot black smoke so of course their first priority was finding David Twig and when the firefighters tried tried to open the store cupboard door they found that it was locked and they feared that maybe David was inside maybe that's where he was trapped eventually they were able to open this door I think they literally had to break the lock or something but they were able to open it and as soon as they did David literally fell out of the storeroom onto the floor he had been on his knees leaning like up against the door so when the door opened he just fell forward and he was unconscious 
purpose. And I actually read on one article that the reason he was on his knees was because he was praying, he was in the prayer position. So an ambulance team was called and paramedics began trying to revive David, trying to save his life. And eventually they had to carry him outside of the building because the paramedics just needed more room to work on him. And his wife, Julie, was just completely hysterical when David was brought outside. She was crying, I think she was screaming. She was just so distressed whilst the paramedics were working on him. For half an hour, the team tried to save David in the back of the ambulance, but unfortunately, nothing was working. He had inhaled too much smoke and eventually he was pronounced dead. Julie was taken to the hospital to be treated for her injuries. I think she may have inhaled a little bit of smoke and she had soot on her face. Her hair was a bit singed from the fire, but she didn't have super serious injuries. So thankfully she was going to be okay. But it was while she was at the hospital being treated that she was informed of her husband's passing. And again, she was just completely, completely distraught. She had just lost the man that she loved, the person that she had been married to for more than 15 years and she was heartbroken. But of course, even though this was all very, very painful for her, the police couldn't wait to talk to Julie. They needed to know exactly what happened on the night that David died. So after she was discharged from the hospital, Julie sat down with the police officers and she began telling them everything she could remember. Julie told the police that on the evening of the 13th of March, 2011, she and David were in his workshop when all of a sudden, these two men ran in and began attacking the two of them. The men immediately grabbed David and dragged him into the storeroom and they locked the door and once he was trapped inside they started a fire just outside of the storeroom door. The men also started trying to drag Julie but thankfully they kind of lost their grip on her and she managed to run out of the building and escape. So she ran out, she grabbed her phone and this was when she made the 999 call and shortly after she escaped she actually recalled seeing the two attackers also exiting the back of the building and fleeing the scene. They ran away. So thinking that it was now safe, Julie decided to go back inside to see if David was okay. However, when she opened the door, she was confronted by a massive gulf of smoke. So she knew it was just way too dangerous for her to go any further. She had to just stand outside and wait for the fire crew to arrive to save her husband. So the police asked Julie if she could describe the two attackers that set the fire, describe what they looked like. However, unfortunately, she said that they were actually wearing wearing hoodies and also masks, so most of their faces were covered. All she could really see was their eye area, like this part of their faces, so she really couldn't tell the police much. I think all she could really tell them was that she was sure it was two men and that she believed they were both white, but that was it. So the hunt was on to find these two men because obviously this was now a murder inquiry. They had killed David Twig. They were very, very dangerous individuals and the police knew that they had to apprehend them quickly. The first thing the police did was ask Julie if she could hand over the clothes that she was wearing when the attack happened because the two men had grabbed her. So hopefully they might be able to find a trace of their DNA on her clothing. Fire investigators were also sent to the scene the morning after the murder because they needed to determine exactly how the fire had been started. And they soon came to the conclusion that the fire had been set using pet the men had poured petrol onto the floor outside of the storeroom and then threw a match onto it, leaving David to essentially burn alive inside and breathe in the very toxic fumes. And it was later confirmed in David's autopsy that his cause of death was from smoke inhalation. He was alive when he was locked inside that cupboard and when the fire started. Forensic teams were also sent to the property to collect any potential evidence in particular, they were looking in the areas where Julie said the attack had happened. Although the police were concerned that they would not find any kind of DNA evidence of the attackers at the scene because, of course, fire can destroy any trace of forensic evidence. But regardless, forensic searches were conducted anyway, just in case they did find anything. So they dusted the scene for fingerprints. And as well as looking for evidence inside, the police also conducted searches outside of the property 
and the surrounding areas just to see if they could find anything that maybe one of the killers had dropped whilst they were running away from the scene. Specifically, the police were actually looking for the key that had been used to lock David inside of the storeroom because the key was never found at the scene. So it seemed as though the men had taken that with them and possibly disposed of it somewhere. And it didn't actually take the police long to find it. A set of keys were found just dumped on the ground in a muddy area, I believe on Julie and David's neighbour's land, which was in the direction of where Julie said the two killers had run. So these keys were collected and taken back to the crime scene and one of them fit the lock on the door. So that was confirmation that this was the key that had been used to trap David. Not long after the murder, the police made the decision to appeal to the public for information. Now the area where this all happened, where this murder happened, was very quiet and remote. Like I said earlier, Julie and David's home was pretty out of the way. It wasn't very close to a main road, but there were sometimes people out walking their dogs around that area. And it was, I think, like early Sunday evening when the attack happened. So the police thought that maybe someone, maybe a dog walker might have seen something, seen the attackers running away from the home. So they appealed to the public for information regarding this murder inquiry and the charity Crime Stoppers even offered a £3,000 reward alongside this appeal as an incentive. And David's wife, Julie, also released a statement to the public. She said, quote, I'm so numb with pain. My heart is broken. I've not just lost my partner of 15 years. I've lost the love of my life, my best friend, my soulmate. Following the appeal, the police did receive numerous potential tips and leads from the public. So they started looking into every single one and it became clear to the police just how much this murder affected the residents of Berlin Marsh. As I said earlier, this was a rather small, quiet village with low crime rates. This kind of thing did not happen here, so it really rocked the area and people were terrified and also just incredibly sad. David was fairly well known around the local area. He had lived in Lincolnshire all his life. He was a joiner, so he did a lot of work for the local people and everyone just thought, he was a lovely man. That is something that I read constantly in my research of this case. Everyone just thought that David was such a gentleman, so they couldn't understand why this had happened. Why would anyone want to do this to someone like David? Well, that's what the police needed to figure out, but to be honest, they were really struggling with that. They couldn't determine who had done this and also what their motive was. At first, they thought it might have been a robbery gone wrong situation because David did have a lot of expensive equipment in his workshop. His machinery cost a lot of money so maybe they went there with the intention of stealing this equipment and selling it on. But as far as I'm aware nothing was actually stolen apart from the keys but as we know they were eventually found. Maybe they did plan on robbing the place but just didn't in the end or perhaps robbery had nothing to do with it. Maybe that wasn't the motive at all. But then why? Why had this happened? Who had decided to, to end David's life? Was this a targeted attack on the married couple? Did someone have something against them or just against David? But after looking some more into David's life and his background, the police couldn't identify anyone that had an issue with him. As I said, he was a very nice, well-respected man. Now, I believe as part of this investigation, the police were also conducting door-to-door -door inquiries. They basically just wanted to speak to pretty much everyone in the local area. Area just to see if they could provide any information about David's murder or just about David and his life. And when the police spoke to the owner of the local garage or gas station in the area, they found out that David and Julie's mail was actually being delivered there. Both their personal mail and business related mail had been redirected to the garage and that had been the case for a little while. The owner said that Julie was the one that requested the mail be sent to the garage and the owner was fine with it. They had had this agreement for some time. The post would get sent to the garage and then Julie would pick it up. But when the police heard about this, they just thought, well, what reason did David and Julie have for doing this? Did they not 
want people to know their address and if so why was there someone in particular that they didn't want knowing their address perhaps the people that killed david so the police began looking into the mail inquiry a bit more and in the meantime they also started looking through david and julie's accounts and their finances just to see if maybe money was a motive in this murder the couple had a joinery business and people in the local area knew this so perhaps someone wanted to steal from their business accounts and when they looked into the couple's finances the police were pretty shocked because they were initially under the impression that the joinery business was doing well but actually that was not the case at all in fact they were in debt massively in debt they had debts of more than forty thousand pounds which is a hell of a lot of money to owe and it was also found that the couple had previously borrowed £400,000 and I'm not entirely sure why I don't know what this loan was for my guess is that they needed it for their joinery business because the kind of equipment that David needed was very very expensive but yeah they were hugely in debt and it was so bad that the business was bankrupt and shortly before his murder a warrant had been declared for David Twig's arrest because it was found that he hadn't been paying off his debts. So this was a very serious situation that David was in and when the detectives realised that all of this was going on before David's death, they were really confused because Julie Dixon hadn't told them any of that in her many police interviews and that is something that the police would need to know about. And it was at this point that the police started to think, well is there a possibility that David didn't know about these debts and didn't know that the business was bankrupt because as we talked about earlier Julie was the one that dealt with the accounts and the finances David had nothing to do with that really he was the laborer and Julie was the one that requested all of their mail be redirected to the garage and they would have been receiving a lot of letters to do with their debts so had she done that so that David wouldn't see the letters was she trying trying to hide their very very bad financial situation from him. So after finding out all of this the detectives became a little bit suspicious of Julie Dixon. It just seemed very odd that she had kept back so much information from the police. Information that could have been useful and very important in this inquiry. Perhaps Julie knew more about this murder than she was letting on. So because of their suspicions the police decided to go back through all of the evidence they had in this case to see if Julie's original story actually matched up with it or if there were any inconsistencies and there were. Now as we know it was determined that the fire had been started by someone pouring petrol on the floor outside of the storeroom door whilst David was trapped inside and then they threw a match onto the petrol. Now I don't know if the petrol can itself was ever found, however the petrol can cap, so the lid, was located on top of a barrel just inside of David's workshop. Someone had placed this cap on top of the barrel which just seemed very unusual because if two men had done this, taken the top off a petrol can, it just seems very strange that they would take the time to place it on top of a barrel. They probably would have been in a hurry, so would they not have just chucked it on the floor? So that was one thing that didn't quite correlate with Julie's story. Another thing was some forensic evidence that was found on her clothing, the clothing that she was wearing on the night of the murder. It was discovered through forensic analysis that Julie's clothes had traces of petrol on them, which had been placed on her clothing in a liquid form. Now as we know Julie said that after she escaped and after the two men had fled the scene she claimed that she went back into the building to see if David was okay. But that as soon as she opened the door she was met by a gulf of smoke so she didn't go any further she just went back outside. But she couldn't have got the petrol on her clothing by just opening the door and walking into the building because fire doesn't spit petrol. The evidence of the liquid petrol 
on her clothes suggested to the experts that at some point Julie must have been holding the petrol can and some of it accidentally spilled onto her but why would Julie have been holding it? So that didn't quite add up but on top of that the injuries that Julie sustained I don't think she really had any serious injuries from what I could tell she just kind of had soot in her face and her hair was singed a bit she might have had a few burns but I can't confirm that but the injuries that she had were not consistent with her version of events she said that she got them when she opened the door to go back into the building and she was met with that gulf of smoke. But experts didn't agree with that. Apparently her injuries were more consistent with her being caught in a vapour cloud right after the fire was ignited. So that means that she must have been very, very close to where the fire was set when the match was thrown onto the petrol. So as I'm sure you've probably guessed, all of this evidence, the petrol on her clothing, the injuries that she had sustained that were consistent with a vapour cloud, the petrol cap being placed on top of a barrel, all of the crime scene evidence indicated to the police that Julie was not telling them the whole truth about what happened that night. And not long after all of this, the police found even more evidence to suggest that Julie was lying, probably the most damning evidence they had yet. As part of their investigation, the police were looking through all the CCTV footage from cameras that were around the local area, and this included the footage that was captured from the camera at the local gas station, the gas station that Julie had their mail sent to and when they looked through this footage from the local gas station they spotted Julie Dixon purchasing a can of petrol just a couple of days before her husband David Twig was murdered. So now the police had quite a substantial amount of evidence against Julie, evidence that suggested that her original story about the two men bursting into the building that night and starting the fire was a lie. The evidence they had pointed to her. It indicated that she was the one that started that fire. She was the one that killed her husband. And so just under three months after the crime, on the 6th of June 2011, Julie Dixon was arrested on suspicion of murder. And apparently Julie didn't really have much of a reaction. She didn't shout or cry she was just calmly taken away to the police station almost like she was expecting it and when she was interviewed at the station Julie absolutely shocked the detectives because she completely changed her original story. She had written a prepared statement alongside her solicitor and in this statement she claimed that David's death was the result of a suicide pact. Julie's new story was that she and her husband David had had enough of life. They were both struggling with severe depression because of their financial situation and they just couldn't see a way out of it and so together they were just going to end it. They didn't want to go on and so on the 13th of March 2011 they decided to kill themselves. They both agreed that they were going to start a fire and die in their home together. However, everything did not go to plan. Julie claimed that she was the one who started the fire, so she poured the petrol and she threw the match. However, she said that right at the last minute, she changed her mind. She got scared and she ran out of the building. But David didn't. He was determined to go through with it and he stayed in the building and eventually he passed away. And she said that afterwards, she felt that she needed to come up with a cover story to mainly protect David's parents. She didn't want them to know the truth that David wanted to die and so she lied and said that it was murder and that two men were responsible but of course these two men were fictional. They did not exist. But I don't think the detectives believed Julie's story, her new story, for one minute because David was locked in a storeroom and the fire started just outside of the storeroom door. If David was really determined to end his life why would he need to be locked in there? It just didn't make any sense. Also, Julie said that she changed her mind right at the last minute. As soon as the fire started, she decided that she didn't want to die. 
but wouldn't that mean that she would have been in the storeroom with David? And if she was in the storeroom, then how did she start the fire on the other side of the door? And also, how did she lock the door and then how did the keys end up on the neighbor's land again the evidence just didn't line up with her story and so the detectives said that and they continued asking her questions about her new version of events but she would not elaborate any further she couldn't explain why david was locked in the storeroom and so she just replied no comment as I said, the detectives didn't really believe this new story at all. They didn't believe that this was a suicide pact, but they still had to look into it just in case she was telling the truth. So they started looking into David and his life again just to see if they could find any evidence that he was actually suicidal, but they didn't find anything. There was nothing to suggest that David wanted to die that night. As part of this line of inquiry, the police also conducted searches of David and Julie's bungalow so not just the business side of their property but also their home side and they actually seized their laptops and computers and when they looked through the search history on one of the computers they discovered that someone had googled things like how can I poison someone and how can I disguise tablets in food and what can you put in food that doesn't show up in a post-mortem and because David had been murdered they of course believed that Julie Dixon was the one that made these Google searches. I also read on one article that it was her user logged in at the time of these Google searches, so it was even more evidence against her and this evidence suggested that this crime was very premeditated. It wasn't like Julie had just snapped on the night of David's death and spontaneously decided to kill him she had clearly been planning this for a while. The evidence was just piling up at this point and it was enough to charge Julie with murder. Julie's trial began in December of 2011 and she pleaded not guilty to the charge. However, by the time the trial rolled around, she actually changed her story again. So this was the third time she had changed it. So as we know, her original story was that two men burst into their work shop and grabbed David and they were the ones that killed him. Her second story when she was arrested was that she and David had a suicide pact. They both wanted to die but Julie ultimately changed her mind at the last minute. But now during the trial she changed it again and she claimed that actually she didn't want to die but David did and so she agreed to help him. It was an assisted suicide. Her new version of events was that David was the one that started the fire with the petrol and she was kind of just a bystander. She didn't actively get involved but she was there when it happened until eventually she ran out of the building when she thought it was too dangerous. So the prosecution had the task of trying to prove to the jury that this was a cold-blooded murder and not an assisted suicide. They ran through all of the evidence the police had collected in this case and using it they presented to the jury what they believed really happened and what Julie's motive was for murder. So like I said, the evidence from the computer search history indicated that Julie had been planning to kill her husband for a while and it's believed that the reason, well the main reason she decided to kill him was because of their financial problems. There was absolutely no evidence to suggest that David ever knew about the debts that they had because why would he? Julie handled all of the finances and he wasn't seeing any of the mail because it had been redirected to the garage. So it's believed that he genuinely had no idea that they were in debt and that the business was virtually bankrupt. Julie had been keeping all of this from him. I don't know why but for whatever reason she did not want to tell him and so she basically just kept ignoring it and coming up with excuses and when debt officials would call and ask to speak to David about the debts, Julie would either say that he was ill so he couldn't come to the phone or she would say that he was working abroad but he wasn't. She just didn't want him to speak to them. She was pretending like everything was fine to David but of 
obviously you can't do that with debts because over time they just increase and increase and the situation gets even more serious and that's exactly what happened. Julie was informed that the bailiffs were going to be coming to see his goods and that David was going to be arrested and she started panicking at this point. She had been keeping all of this a secret for ages now and she realised that if she didn't do something David was going to find out soon and so instead of just telling him about the situation and trying to sort it out she decided that she was going to kill him. It's also been suggested that another motive Julie had was just simply that she did not want to be with David anymore. Apparently she would tell her friends that she wasn't happy in the marriage for whatever reason and she was planning on leaving him. But anyway, she decided that she was going to kill him and the night of the 13th of March 2011 was when she was going to do it. As we know, a couple of days before the murder, she purchased a can of petrol from the local gas station and then on the evening of the 13th she called David into the storeroom in the workshop. She probably tricked him into going in there somehow and then once he was inside she shut the door behind him and locked it using the key. She then grabbed the petrol can, took off the cap, placed it on top of a barrel on the side and then she started pouring it on the floor outside of the storeroom door and then she got some matches, lit one, and threw it onto the petrol and as soon as she threw it down the vapor cloud and the flames started which is when she got her injuries and I can't even imagine how scared David must have been it it must have just been absolutely terrifying for him being locked in that cupboard and realizing that he was going to die and that his wife the woman that he loved and had loved for more than 15 years was his killer and not knowing why either remember he had no idea about the deaths he had no idea that his wife was planning this he must have just been so confused after julie set the fire she ran outside and dumped the keys on her neighbor's land close by and then it's actually believed that she went back into the building well not into the workshop where the fire was she didn't go into the business side of the property she went into there bungalow and went to the bathroom and the reason they think she went into the bathroom was because during forensic searches of the home they found some singed hairs in the sink that when tested were found to have come from Julie Dixon and it's theorized that she went into the bathroom to just kind of check herself and examine her injuries because she clearly didn't expect to have been caught in the vapor cloud and also she probably just wanted to kill some time before she rang the emergency services because she would have wanted to make sure that David was dead before they arrived. If he wasn't and he was alive and he survived then he could tell them who did this to him. After her time in the bathroom Julie then grabbed her phone and went outside of the home and that's when she called 999 and the whole act began. And what's interesting about the 999 call that the police noticed after they began to suspect Julie is that at the beginning of the call she actually starts to explain what happened to the operator so before she even says that her husband is trapped inside of their home and that it's on fire she runs through the events so she says oh we were in our workshop picking some things out when all of a sudden these people came up to us from behind and attacked us and set fire to the place when really that information about why they were in their workshop and what exactly happened isn't relevant to the 999 operator they just need to know who's in danger and where they are so that they can send out emergency services immediately but it was like julie felt she had to tell them her fake story first so that it seemed true so that she could get that part out of the way and when the fire team and the ambulance crew arrived at the scene and began treating david she turned on the act again she pretended that she was this heartbroken grieving wife and she played the part very well 
now because no one suspected her in the beginning. Even the detectives didn't suspect her at the start. They just felt so sorry for Julie and they had no idea that in reality the killer they were looking for for about three months was her. But when the cracks in her original story started to appear and she was arrested, she came up with a new story, the suicide pack story. And then as we know, when it came to her trial, she changed this to the assisted suicide story. However, to everyone's shock again, not very long into the trial, I think it was on like the second or third day, she actually decided to change her story again. At the very beginning of her court proceedings, she pleaded not guilty to murder, but now she decided to change her plea. She decided to plead guilty. She finally admitted that yes, this was murder. This was not a suicide pact or an assisted suicide. She killed her husband. And it's theorized that the only reason she did that was because she realized just how much evidence the prosecution had to indicate that this was murder. It was just so overwhelming and it probably became clear to her that due to the amount of evidence they had, the chances of her being found not guilty of this were very very slim so might as well plead guilty and just hope for a lesser sentence. 43 year old Julie Dixon was sentenced to a minimum of 23 years in prison for the murder of her husband David Twig. So at the earliest she will be considered for parole in 2034 or 2035 and that is it for this case. That is the case of David Twig, a really devastating one. I know I've already said it in this video but I honestly cannot comprehend how scary David's final moments must have been. To be locked inside that cupboard in the dark with smoke flowing in and flames at the door, it must have just been so, so frightening. David's parents, Roy and Janice Twig, are obviously heartbroken over the loss of their son, but they are also heartbroken because the person that did this to him was someone that they loved pretty much just as much as they loved him. They honestly treated Julie as if she were their own child and they supported her at the beginning of the investigation. They shared their grief with her and the whole time they were none the wiser that she was the one that caused all of this. After Julie was sentenced, Roy and Janice Twig actually released a statement. They said, quote, we have lost our only son David at the hands of someone we have loved and treated as a daughter. David was a kind, decent, hard-working man who took great pride in his work and the service he provided to people. We do not want to comment on our thoughts about Judy Dixon, who is finally admitted to murdering our wonderful son, but have to say we are happy to see justice finally done and will leave her with her own thoughts. But yeah, that is the end of this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments. Also let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. A reminder that I do have a case request form linked in the description box. That's probably the best place to suggest a case because I check my case request form every single week. Before I go, I just want to say thank you once again to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can get 20% off your first order with them when you click my link in the description box. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!